watching KPIX Channel 5. Now, live Eyewitness News at 10. Why did this woman cut off her husband's penis? She says he raped her. He says she was jealous. Mr. and Mrs. Bobbitt went to court today. In Los Angeles, a convicted child molester is charged with threatening to start wildfires. Police claim he sent a letter saying, I laughed at all those people crying over lost property. More on those stories in a moment. First, the rash of violence against workers at some fast food restaurants in the Bay Area. The most recent example, the murder of a fast food worker gunned down on the job in Oakland. And tonight, other workers wonder if their jobs are worth their lives. Wendy Hanamora is in Oakland right now with a live report. Wendy? That's right, Kate. Fast food workers here in Oakland are looking over their shoulders tonight because just this weekend at this Jack in the Box on Telegraph Avenue, two men wearing ski masks, waving revolvers, held this place up. Then just across town on Heckenberger Road, there was a robbery and murder at another Jack in the Box. Today, the workers I spoke with were very shaken. Some were even considering whether they should change their line of work. I'm considering other types of jobs out of Oakland because it's getting rough. It's, it's easy to rob somebody who can't protect themselves, you know, young kids and stuff and teenagers and stuff like that, working to have a little extra money, you know, or helping support the families. It was a fast food worker's worst nightmare. 2.30 a.m. Sunday morning, an armed robber drove through Jack in the Box for an order, but instead demanded cash and left the 20-year-old worker dead. Fast food employees here on the Heckenberger Strip say danger is part of the job. It's just that customers, they come at nighttime around 2, 3 in the morning, they're like high and drunk and they want to order something, they just want to rob you, you know, a hard time. In fact, gunmen held up this nearby McDonald's last year. Last week, there was an attempted robbery at the Taco Bell next door. Many fast food workers are young and support families on the four fifty dollars an hour they earn here. Corey works till 5 a.m. and would like safer work, but doubts in this economy that he can find it. Especially if you don't have a high school diploma, it's very tough. So that leaves fast food workers vulnerable. Police on patrol say there are precautions these chains are not taking. You could be highly visible inside, like this Taco Bell has the bean burrito sign and they have the breakfast sign, and that really blocks the view from if I'm a police officer and I'm driving by, I can't see inside the store. Tonight, Jack in the Box put new security on patrol, but what more will the corporation do to protect employees in these dangerous times? We're looking at all our provisions and we're going to decide which course of action we're going to take from this point on, yes, we will. Oakland police say that there have been 135 armed robberies at fast food places in Oakland this year alone. Now, figure it out, that's about one every other day. Now, when you magnify that over the whole Bay Area, you start to get a sense of how serious a problem this really is. In San Jose, they are looking for some solutions, and that's where Robert Honda is standing by live with more on the story. Robert? Wendy, some of the details in your story sounded pr pretty familiar here in the South Bay. We're here in San Jose at one of 13 Taco Bell restaurants that do business within the city. You know, when Taco Bell first applied for permits to operate on a 24-hour basis in San Jose, Taco Bell probably didn't know it was going to end up in the center of the city's growing gang problem. But that's what happened. Now, ironically, no one at City Hall blames Taco Bell for the growing gang problems, but they say, unfortunately, late-night hours don't attract just late-night snackers. It also seems to attract trouble. Fast food is only one reason why Taco Bell restaurants are so popular with youngsters in San Jose. Another big reason is the late hours. Police are recommending that 24-hour businesses, specifically Taco Bells, be restricted during late night hours because it encourages what they call gang-related activity. A police study shows that in the first six months of 1993, there have already been 237 incidents of crime at San Jose Taco Bells, including numerous shootings, stabbings and drunken behavior. If they're selling food, it gives them the legal right to be there and to congregate. They're not breaking the law. But in fact, it would be uh, in a situation where it could be an issue of safety for other people coming into the area or even a confrontation with another group of uh, young people that uh, may get into some sort of confrontation that could lead to somebody getting hurt. A lot of youngsters we talk to around some of the local Taco Bells admit the restaurants do become gang hangouts late at night but say restricting business hours won't change the activity, just the location. Everybody just hangs out. It's just like some people that, you know, just mess, uh, mess around, you know, and get in fights and stuff like that. Otherwise, everybody's just out to have a good time. 
That's what I think. I don't know. You think cutting the hours at Taco Bell will make any kind of difference? Um, not not really because everybody just looked for another place to go to, you know, and it will end up the same thing. So it doesn't really matter. The reason why they um, end up here is they want to find out, you know, where the parties are late at night and just to get to know each other out here. Do you think it. cutting the hours at Taco Bell would make a difference? No, not really. Why not? Because people, else, you know, they'll just go out somewhere else to, you know, talk. Now, the city will take a final vote on this controversial proposal at the end of the month. Some of the restrictions could include cutting back on hours as well as a complete elimination of walk-up windows after midnight. Now, some people, as you heard, still question the fairness of it all, but at this point, the proposal has the blessing of Mayor Susan Hammer, the police department, and the district attorney's office. Reporting live in San Jose, Robert Honda. Matt, Kate, back to you. All right, thanks, Robert. Murder in the workplace used to be rare, and now it is the third most common cause of death on the job. Later in this newscast, Doug Murphy looks at this disturbing trend. Who is at risk, and when should you be the most careful? Stay with us for the start of our special report, Murder at Work. He's on trial for allegedly raping his wife. Soon, she'll be on trial for cutting off his penis. What really happened between Lorena and John Wayne Bobbitt? We have a report from Joan Gartland. The two main players in the sexual soap opera arrived at the Manassas, Virginia courthouse this morning, not talking about the incident. It seems almost everyone else has been talking about since it happened last June. 24 year old Lorena Bobbitt, wearing a purple coat, looked down as she passed through a gauntlet of reporters and photographers. 26 year old John Bobbitt was accompanied by an aunt and uncle who raised him in Niagara Falls, New York. Lorena Bobbitt told the jury her husband had raped her several times before the night last June in which she says she retaliated by cutting off his penis. But as John Bobbitt stared at her, she also testified that she had had what she called consensual sex with him three days before the incident. The manicurist, originally from Venezuela, broke down crying as she described the night last June at her Manassas apartment when she says she woke up with her husband on top of her. She identified the torn green underwear she says he pulled off her with his foot. She says he held down her hands and put his tongue and later his shoulder over her mouth so she couldn't scream and had sex with her. Afterward, she says she was angry and she went to the kitchen and got a knife, went back to the bedroom, pulled back the sheet and cut him. In opening statements today, John Bobbitt's attorney, Greg Murphy, said his client had told Lorena Bobbitt he was going to divorce her and she was driven by jealousy, not rape. John Bobbitt may not have been the most sensitive lover, Greg Murphy told the jury, but he did not rape his wife. He fell asleep after the couple had sex that night, Murphy said, and doesn't remember anything until he felt like his genitals were being pulled off. He gave a silent scream, Murphy said. He reached down and realized what happened. You satisfied, Mr. Bobbitt? No comment. In Manassas, Virginia, Joan Gartland for CBS News. The man they call Dr. Death, Jack Kevorkian, is out on bail tonight after spending the weekend in jail. Kevorkian was released after an attorney posted his $2,000 bond, saying he was tired of all the media attention. The suicide doctor was taken into custody on charges related to his 19th assisted suicide. Dr. Kevorkian refused to post his own bail or eat while in jail. No bail tonight for the man accused of promising to turn Southern California into an inferno. He has not been charged with actually starting any of the fires. Federal investigators say he was arrested after sending a threatening letter to our sister station, KCBS-TV. Harvey Levin has details. 43-year-old Thomas Lee Larson appeared in court this afternoon, charged with the federal crime of using the mail to threaten destruction of property by means of fire. Action News first broke the story of the letter, mailed last September to 35 people in the Los Angeles area. The author, who signed his name Fedbuster, threatened to start fires on a hot, windy fall day. He said arson would be his revenge for being treated unfairly in a criminal case. This is the letter that broke the case wide open. It's a new letter written specifically to me last week. Federal authorities say the author is Larson. He provides non-public information that suggests he is indeed Fedbuster. In it, he appears to take responsibility for some of the recent arson fires. The following is an excerpt word for word, quote, And by the way, I did more than one, but I ain't saying what ones. You guess. Gotta give you something to do. I loved seeing everyone crying at lost property. 
you wonder how a human being could be so screwed up as to uh, take pride in it in hurting other people. Federal agents were secretly following Larson last Saturday when they saw him deposit the letter addressed to me in this Long Beach mailbox. They retrieved it and the next day arrested Larson at his home in Van Nuys. This afternoon, federal judge Charles Ike ruled Larson was a danger to the community and ordered him held without bail. I think uh, uh, he's an intelligent person and uh, he's obviously extremely concerned by the nature of the charges. In Los Angeles, Harvey Levin for CBS News. The man who has confessed to setting more than two dozen fires in Santa Clara County will appear in court this week. Police say the 29-year-old Glenn Iwanaga has admitted to setting 26 grass fires in the Gilroy area over the past five months. No homes or buildings were damaged in those fires and no one was hurt. Police say Iwanaga told them he doesn't know why he set those fires. And in Sacramento, 18-year-old Richard Campos is expected to enter a plea on Wednesday in connection with five racially motivated fire bombings. The most recent incident was last month when a Molotov cocktail was tossed into the home of City Councilman Jimmy Yee. Richard Campos was arrested Saturday. Police say he is a follower of the white supremacist movement, but they believe he acted alone. If convicted, Campos could face life in prison. Church leaders got into a heated debate with gays and lesbians at San Francisco City Hall today. Manuel Ramos has details. Surrounded by his supporters, fundamentalist leader Lou Sheldon marched into City Hall to demand the arrest of gay and lesbian protesters. In fact, local pastor David Ennis pointed one out to the police. Hi. That guy right there. Oh, this is absurd. I was there. He wasn't doing He's anything lying. of the sort. You're lying to you your team. You're He's lying. lying. Reverend Sheldon's appearance at the Hamilton Square Baptist Church last September prompted a protest by gays and lesbians. This tape provided by the church shows a lot of screaming and yelling, but church leaders say there were also assaults and vandalism, but so far only one arrest. Gays and lesbians say Sheldon has preached hatred against homosexuals. That is not the issue. The issue is not being anti-gay. And our beliefs are not the issue. What we believe is not the issue. The issue is our freedom in the United States of America to believe what we believe, practice what we practice, as long as it's within the uh, confines of decency and keeping the law. Gays and lesbians met the church group at the doors of the Board of Supervisors. They try to drown each other out with songs and hymns. Gay and lesbian leaders say they don't condone vandalism or violence, but they say if it did occur that Sunday night, they wouldn't condemn it. If there was no religious service involved, that it was a hate rally preaching violence against the gay and lesbian people. The violence is being done to us and has been done to us for approximately 2,000 years now. Church leaders say if the supervisors don't order more arrests, Christians will continue to be assaulted. Gays and lesbians say any more arrests will be persecution. In San Francisco, Manuel Ramos, Channel 5, Eyewitness News. It's a new day for 18-year-olds in San Francisco, or more accurately, it's a new night. A judge has thrown out a law banning them from after-hours dancing clubs. That law was passed in 1970 to keep minors out of topless bars, but largely unenforced until last March. Today, a judge ruled that 18-year-olds aren't considered minors anymore, so the law is void. Still to come, a plan to have you pay more at the pump to help some people get car insurance. And before you go shopping for the holidays, a list of the best and worst toys. A week storm in the Pacific headed our way. We'll have the forecast for you later in weather. Then, how dangerous can going to work be? And how can we make it safer? You're watching Dave Michelhatton and Kate Kelly. California drivers soon may have to pay 25 cents more for a gallon of gasoline and about $140 more for their car registration as part of a new proposal that could be on the state ballot next November to guarantee car insurance for every driver. People of California are angry that there are 5 million uninsured motorists on the road, that they're paying over a billion dollars a year and premiums, uninsured motorist premiums, just to protect themselves against uninsured motorists. Will this new plan mean an increase in our car insurance rates? Well, the experts say the answer is no. In fact, under the pump insurance plan, most California drivers would actually end up paying less for their premiums. 
A small earthquake in the North Bay prompted several phone calls to KPIX today, and this is what it looked like on Channel 5 seismograph. The quake measured 3.5 on the Richter scale, and it happened about 12.30 this afternoon. The epicenter was about 10 miles east of Santa Rosa on the Rogers Creek Fault. There were no reports of damage or injuries. Firefighters in Oakland will soon be carrying a portable machine that could save the lives of cardiac arrest victims. Ken Bastida has the story. Stand clear. These Oakland Stand firefighters are training on a dummy today, but the next time this new life-saving tool is needed, it may be for real. The department has installed these portable defibrillators in all of its first response fire engines. Firefighters need no longer wait for paramedics to arrive to shock cardiac arrest victims back to life. Nationwide, the statistics show that if this shock is delivered under the first five minutes, coupled with early 911 access and citizen CPR, that some studies cite a, an improved save rate of up to 60%. We believe that even without citizen CPR training, this machine can double the save rate of a patient cardiac arrest. The average emergency response time for firefighters in Oakland is about three minutes right now. That's several minutes faster than paramedics who are dispatched countywide. The key is in administering the procedure as soon as possible. Oakland fire officials say these defibrillators can make a difference when minutes count. And minutes can be the difference between life and death. We get a short period of time when they don't die, when they actually are still alive, that we can reverse it, but it's a very short period of time. It's only three to five minutes. If somebody comes along and starts CPR, we maybe can stretch that another three to five minutes, but nothing beyond that. And the defibrillator is the thing that makes the big difference. The department averages about two dozen cardiac arrest calls a month. More than 225 firefighters have now been trained to use the devices. In Oakland, Ken Bastida, Channel 5 Eyewitness News. Toys should be fun for your children, but some toys can be dangerous. A consumer group in Boston has just released a list of toys they say could seriously injure your child. Plastic buttons on this one that could be swallowed. No age recommendations. Edward Swartz is on his annual crusade against the toy industry that he says can often take the fun out of playtime. You wouldn't want to be hit with that. It's called a pigeon shoot. It also comes with its own darts, and it's sold for children as young as three. They accept sharpened pencils. It has no safety. You have to load it, spring load it by this way, looking down at it. And occasionally they discharge while you're loading it. There's the dagger of doom and the eliminator, seven weapons in one, which Schwartz says is physically and emotionally damaging to children. If you're talking about gun control, do me a favor, gentlemen, ladies. Let's start where we should start. Let's disarm our nurseries. There are subtle hazards like toys with instructions written only in Korean, cuddly toys like Dopey and Sneezy that seem innocent enough. His um, belt comes off and could be choked on. It violates the small parts regulation. Above all, Swartz says, are industry-wide standards that are incomplete and often ignored. They want to make a buck on kids. They put profits before people. So what about the good toys? Here are some of the toys to trust. Hide Inside by Discovery Toys. It's a felt box with animals inside. Rocking Rider Horse by Today's Kids. A very sturdy plastic horse for children to ride. The Air Pogo by Hyper-G. A pogo stick that hangs by an overhead support. And The Castle by Northern Light Enterprises. Children can build their own castle with cardboard pieces. Still to come, the president pulling out all the stops on the eve of the key debate over NAFTA. Then, the world's most famous princess fighting back over pictures like this. And later, does Joe Montana still watch his old team play? No. Wayne Walker went to find out. No number or anything like this. He said, I can tell. Questions about today's news? Eyewitness News has answers. Is it doomed for thousands of American jobs or the only way American can, America can compete in the 21st century? Those are the claims swirling around NAFTA. And now Congress is getting ready to vote on the free trade agreement. Regina Blakely has more. With just nine days to go before the House votes on the North American Free Trade Agreement, and with unofficial tallies indicating the president does not have the votes he needs, the White House is fighting the clock. 
Tomorrow night, the administration pits yeah, Vice President Al Gore against outspoken NAFTA, NAFTA opponent Ross Perot in a televised debate. With Gore known for his somewhat unyielding nature, and Perot for straying from substance and relying on memorable one-liners, many question the tactic. I guess the calculation they made at the White House was that Ross Perot is in trouble with the public. His ratings are not as good as they used to be. A lot of people have soured on him and think he's kind of a jerk or don't believe him, don't, he doesn't have good credibility, so that you're fighting against somebody with diminished credibility. And the president has another foe, organized labor. In an attempt to counter what Mr. Clinton calls roughshod, muscle-bound tactics by unions to try to convince lawmakers to vote against the agreement, he is meeting personally with the undecided. And while many lawmakers still won't commit, they acknowledge NAFTA opponents have made it clear this battle is political hardball. They laid down the gauntlet and said, essentially to me, this is total divorce. You don't uh, vote with us. Um, we are not with you. And on yet a third front, administration officials are keeping up the public relations fight, comparing this vote with the close but victorious budget battle. We won that vote. We've won a number of critical votes trying to get this government to move forward and break gridlock. Uh, let's wait till the votes are counted. It is going to win. But those statements aside, it is more than obvious that the president has a long, hard fight in front of him, the outcome of which could not only affect his credibility on the Hill, but as a world leader. Regina Blakely, CBS News, the White House. The Bay Area congressional delegation is strongly anti-NAFTA. Ron Dellums and George Miller are among the seven representatives who have gone on record as opposing the treaty. Anna Eshoo and Norman Mineta are still undecided. Nancy Pelosi is the Bay Area's only NAFTA supporter in the House of Representatives. On the road to the debate with Vice President Gore about NAFTA, Ross Perot made a statement. He says that he's the target of a death plot. Just yesterday, Perot announcing that a group of six Cuban assassins have been sent to kill him before the NAFTA debate. Tonight, the Justice Department is downplaying the threat. Officials say that it was a secondhand story from an anonymous tip line, and threats of that kind are fairly common. The name George Bush is back in the election news again tonight. George Bush Jr., that is. In Houston today, the son of the former president kicked off his campaign to unseat Democratic Governor Ann Richards. Bush's name surfaced during the nationwide investigation of the savings Thank and loan you, industry, you, but he has never been charged with any crime. Bush is the managing partner of the Texas Rangers baseball team. A spectacular fire in Houston has destroyed a warehouse and touched off a series of explosions. The warehouse, which covered two square blocks, was filled with paper and plastics, as well as cylinders filled with propane and butane. Because of the explosions, fire crews had a tough time getting close to the building. The flames burned for more than two hours and then died out. No one was hurt. Coming up, thieves who broke in and stole millions of dollars worth of classic artwork. We'll have your local forecast, the six-day outlook, and pictures of Seattle doing an imitation of San Francisco in July. And why is the American workplace turned so dangerous, and how can it be made any safer? What to wear tomorrow? Brian Sussman has the answer. Well, if you look really close, you can almost see Seattle here. Dense fog in the Pacific Northwest this morning. Seattle doing an imitation of San Francisco in July. Welcome back, everyone, on satellite, the Pacific doing an imitation of a weak winter storm. On the close-up, we're seeing a few high clouds moving into the state right now. Fog remains along portions of the coast, otherwise clear skies at least through the southern portion of our state. Now, these are temperatures for tomorrow. We'll see a little bit of a southwesterly breeze tomorrow, which means temperatures could pop up a degree or two in some cases from where we were today. So in San Francisco, morning low 51, afternoon high 68 degrees. San Jose, 72, morning low 45, kind of chilly in Pleasanton, 42 the start there, afternoon high of 71 degrees, 68, 49 the spread in Oakland for tomorrow, we'll bring Pittsburgh in at 74 and 47, chilly start as always in Petaluma this time of the year, 39 the low, 74 degrees the high, that's for tomorrow. I want to go back to the jet stream, show you what's happening with the storm track, we only talk about it certain times of the year, this is one of them. We'll start seeing some energy coming down from the north, tie in with this weak moisture source to the south, and we could see a few light showers as far south as Santa Barbara Wednesday, 
maybe a dusting of snow in the Sierra Wednesday night. Now here's your forecast. For tonight, partly cloudy skies, light winds, overnight lows generally in the 40s and 50s, partly cloudy for tomorrow too, with highs, as I mentioned, 60s and 70s throughout the area. A few showers possible on Wednesday, increasing in intensity and duration towards the north. And then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, how about a warm-up, even at the coast? And believe it or not, we've had a few calls from some of you early risers. Tomorrow morning, 6 a.m., what's in the sky? Well, here's what you saw this morning, some combination there of a Venus, Jupiter, and Spica, and that's the way it will look tomorrow at 6 a.m. And Matt, Kate, I tell you, just so you don't have to wake up, look, <laughs> just We trust promise me. we'll take your word. It's Thank there. you. Enough rain to get rid of the haze? Well, probably enough rain just to mess up your car. Oh, That's just enough really to the way I'm blur looking at the this windshield. Yeah. <laughs> Terrific. Thanks, us. Well, some of the stars of the culinary world were gathered tonight in San Francisco for the 12th annual March of Dimes Gourmet Gala. Tonight at the Fairmont, hundreds of people turned out for a chance to taste some of the country's finest cuisine. Chefs from restaurants like Aqua, Fleur de Lis, and Masa's in San Francisco to Ariola, New York, contributed to an incredible evening, all benefiting the March of Dimes mission for healthier babies. Still to come on Eyewitness News, danger where you work. What's going on and what can anyone do about it? And the princess with a persistent problem over pictures. You're watching Dave McElhatton, Kate Kelly, Wayne Walker, and Brian Sussman. How safe are you at your job? That's becoming an increasingly important concern as on-the-job murder becomes more and more common. It's now the third leading cause of worker deaths. Doug Murphy looks at the reasons why. A disturbed former client opens fire in a San Francisco high-rise. Eight die. At a Michigan post office, a fired worker seeks revenge, killing four, injuring five. And in a jewelry store in Washington, D.C., hold-up men use their weapons. The motives, the circumstances are different. The bottom line, the same. The American workplace has become a killing field. Each week, 15 people are murdered just trying to earn a living. At least 750 people a year are murdered at work. And some studies say the number may be as much as twice that high. Criminologist Mike Rustigan. In the last 30 years, there's been a doubling in homicide statistics, a tripling in overall criminal violence. So what we're seeing at the workplace is a reflection of the violence that has been on the rise in society. The vast majority of workplace murders occur during cash transaction robberies. And the deadliest workplace is the taxi cab. The National Institute for Occupational Health and Safety reports that 27 of every 100,000 cabbies were slain during the 80s. That's 40 times the national average. How bad is this problem? Let's use the Postal Service as an example. We've all heard of the problems the Postal Service has with murder in the workplace. But consider this. Per 100,000 workers, the number of homicides on the job for the Postal Service is actually below the national average. But the Postal Service has led the way in the disturbing trend where a co-worker, a spouse, or an angry customer is the killer. There's a spirit of revenge in our culture right now. Now the attitude is, well, hey, those people are to blame. And I'm not going to just get drunk. I'm not going to just, you know, get strung out on drugs. I'm not going to commit suicide. I'm going to take a bunch of those people with me because they're at fault. We are seeing something which I would certainly label as an epidemic. Labor attorney Gary Mathiasen of the firm Littler Mendelssohn specializes in setting up programs for companies to deal with workplace violence. Tragically, business is booming. What we are seeing in the workplace is a willingness on the part of certain employees or former employees or customers to use violence as a tool for resolving a problem in the workplace. A willingness to use violence is only one of the reasons that at least 100 people a year now lose their lives in workplace get-even killings. The experts say that an abundance of guns contributes to the carnage. And in the media and films, we are bombarded with violent images. Hey, I'm really sorry. Yeah, well, hey, I'm really sorry too. <laughs> 
Critics will ask if movies like Michael Douglas's Falling Down is art imitating life or a training film for the disgruntled. Whole shelf looks suspect. And with the economy limping along, there is a new trigger today, the fear that your job could be gone tomorrow. Losing a job or not being able to get reemployed is a, is a real blow to someone's sense of worth. Psychologist Dr. Steve White treats the victims of workplace violence and those on the edge. He says that for some, a firing is the last straw. They don't have that bottom line where they can pick up and say, OK, whatever's happened, I'm the one who's going to make this right. Only a tiny segment of the workforce will ever cause problems, but security expert Jim Kaywood sees Absolutely. no reason I, I that their impact will go away. Is that when we started doing this in 1985, what we told clients is that you, you anticipate that this is only going to happen once in your economic lifetime. It's going to happen one big earthquake, one big fire. There's going to be one big problem you're going to have with workplace violence. What we're telling companies now is you can expect to have maybe three of these a year if you have more than 100 employees. And if violence strikes, it can be catastrophic. It can destroy a company and bring it to its knees, but fundamentally it's a, a terrible and tragic waste of innocent lives, and that, it just has a profound traumatic effect for, for years. Uh, companies are never quite the same. In San Francisco, Doug Murphy, Channel 5, Eyewitness News. Tomorrow, Doug looks at which workers are most likely to turn into killers, why it's not true that some people just snap and how you can spot the warning signs of trouble in your co-workers. Topping world news tonight, $52 million in uninsured artwork is still missing. Six works by Picasso and two by French cubist George Brock were stolen from Stockholm's Modern Museum last night. The curator said the thief or thieves climbed through a hole in the roof without sounding the security alarm. All of the works belong to the museum's permanent exhibition. Princess Diana has broken royal tradition, especially when it comes to the tabloids. She filed and won a court injunction, stopping the Daily Mirror from printing any more photos of her working out at the gym. Normally, the royals ignore the tabloids, but Diana made it clear through her attorney that she wasn't going to be silent and let it happen again. The tabloid issued a statement that no more pictures would be released without, quote, adequate notice. Diana's sister-in-law is also in the news tonight. It looks like the Duke and Duchess of York, better known as Andrew and Fergie, are heading to divorce court. Sarah Ferguson's sister says that since the royal couple has been separated for a year and no reconciliation is in sight, divorce is almost certain. The search for a new Scarlett O'Hara is over. British actress Joanne Whaley Kilmer has been cast to play Scarlett in the TV miniseries Scarlett. The announcement was made today in Los Angeles. Scarlett will pick up where Gone with the Wind left off. One big question, who will play the dashing Rhett Butler? That role has yet to be cast. But as Scarlett O'Hara would say, tomorrow is another day. Coming up, how does Joe Montana feel about playing in Kansas City? Wayne Walker went there to find out. Joe Montana is beloved and missed by many in the Bay Area, but does he miss us? Wayne Walker went to Kansas City to find out. Okay, there's no doubt that uh, Joe Montana does miss the Bay Area. I met with him at his new home in Kansas City. The kids were running around. His mom was there, so there was homemade spaghetti sauce cooking on the stove, and life seems pretty good for the Montana since Joe decided to leave. In April, an emotional earthquake hit the Bay Area. The San Francisco 49ers have just completed the most difficult task this franchise has faced since its very inception. Joe Montana has been traded to the Kansas City Chiefs pursuant to his request. Everyone is very somber but you. Carmen Policy wasn't smiling and Eddie DeBartolo wasn't smiling, but you seemed uh, to know what you wanted to do and, and be very happy about the situation and ready to move on. You still feel that way? Well, I, I think it in... And looking back on things, I, it was probably uh, in the way things were presented where it was the best for me um, at that time and the best for the 49ers. And um, I feel uh, pretty happy here at, at this point. I have an opportunity to be back on the field when I can get there. <laughs> When on the field, Montana shines. The problem is keeping number 19 healthy. But where old injuries haunt him, new encounters forge a new strength. 
I ask him how training camp with the Chiefs in Wisconsin compared to working with the Niners in Rockland. It was one of those things that, you know, when something's new, it becomes exciting about it. And there was a certain, a little bit amount of fear and, and a scare, you know, a little bit, a little bit of afraid going into that situation. You still have unknown. that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And um, About what? I don't know. You just, you, you want to go in and you want to be, um, you don't want people to prejudge you of uh, coming from the 49ers and coming from um, a successful team coming in there and thinking that people had a lot of different perceptions of what I was all about. You've been watching your old team? Oh yeah, oh yeah, I always keep an eye on them. Got to, I've got too many friends on that team and I have too many good memories of not to. Who, who have you stayed in contact with? I, I know you were back in the Bay Area a short while ago. Yeah, well, you know, I tried to keep in contact with um, usually Bones and Harris and uh, the training staff. I'll call every now and then. I'll call in the equipment room and, and give everybody a hard Translate time. Translate that Steve yeah. Bono and Harris Barton, right? <laughs> uh, no, I, no, then I call, no, I'll call and talk to Ray and Lindsay and yeah. Teddy and Bronk and, and those guys, and I get on down the line, you know. I sit in there and I got my old phone list, and whoever hasn't changed their number every now and then gets a call from me, so. What about this team? You know, it's like, uh, I don't want to say, you know, who do you hang with because us guys don't do that anymore. We bond. So <laughs> who have you bonded with on this team? Well, I've only been here a short time, but I, I think I spend most of my time with, um, with probably Dave Craig. And, and uh, it's actually been pretty good all around. Montana is also bonding well with players like Marcus <laughs> Allen and Jonathan Hayes. Joe calls it one of those offensive things because they're in the same meetings all the time. Tomorrow night, Joe and I talk about the age factor and also what he thought of Michael Jordan's retirement. Well, he looks great, too. And when you're talking about someone like Montana, you have to think about the security that goes around him. Did the Chiefs have any idea what they were getting into when he came there? They didn't have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> they really, they didn't have a clue of how to handle, you know, the crowd control of when he gets off the buses and, and, and what they had to do at, at, at their training camp. And you know, they just really didn't have a clue. And it was, <laughs> they, they're learning fast, though. Yeah, they have to. <laughs> yeah. How about Eddie DeBartolo? Joe still keep in touch? Yeah, he said that they've talked on the telephone several times. and. Uh, uh, he, he never wants to lose that relationship, uh, you know, besides football. Their, their relationship goes much past uh, an owner and a player relationship anymore. And, and uh, so they stay in touch. They do. And we'll, we'll have a lot more on that uh, coming up uh, tomorrow and the day after that. Well, as they say, these are the times that try men's souls of Kansas City tonight. Green Bay's Brent Favre had a trying time, to say the least. Actually, Bernie Kozar won't even have trying times with Cleveland anymore. And speaking of trying times, Don Nelson has had his share, but he says not to worry. We're not going to let them get down because uh, we're going through hard times because it won't be very long and they'll be dealing with good times again. We'll let the good and bad times roll after we roll a few commercials. sports questions Wayne Walker has answers no matter how great Joe Montana is he does not play defense his Kansas City teammates though certainly do Montana had his eyes on the Packers tonight but Joe missed the game because of a hamstring injury Green Bay led 9-3 in the third quarter then Derek Thomas hammered the ball from Brett Favre Dan Saliamuna collects the fumble and rolls 16 yards for a touchdown KC would lead 2016 in the fourth quarter then with just less than six minutes to go, Salamua drills Daryl Thompson. Tracy Rogers recovers for a touchback. The Packers commit six turnovers, and Kansas City wins at 23-16. The Chiefs are 6-2. and two. The Pack is 4-4. Four and four. A stunner today in Cleveland. The Browns let go of Bernie Kosar, the man who's been the mainstay of the franchise for the past nine seasons. Kosar got a hero's welcome late today on his way to a radio show. Kozar's production has declined recently, and he has had a difficult relationship with Cleveland head coach Bill Belichick. But Kozar said he doesn't need to defend himself. As disappointing as emotional uh, uh, a day as today has been, um, I, I really know that when I wake up tomorrow, I'm going to be able to look myself in the mirror and know that I've uh, conducted myself with, with class and, and maintain my character throughout the whole thing. And, this was Kozar's last pass with the Browns, a touchdown to Michael Jackson in the closing moments of yesterday's 29-14 loss at Denver. Todd Philcox will start for Cleveland Sunday against Seattle. 
The Warriors meet Houston in their home opener tomorrow night. Chris Weber is expected to play after he missed the team's first two games because of a sprained ankle. Weber's injury rates is merely a blip, though, compared to the Warriors' truly serious problems uh, affecting Messrs. Hardaway, Marshallonis, and Mullen. Don Nelson's first inside basketball segment focuses on how he and his players are dealing with that adversity. Uh, it's not an easy situation, but it's one I think that, uh, that you can handle. And when you go through hard times, it always makes you uh, a stronger person. And I hope that uh, I've, I'm strong enough now to, <laughs> so I don't have to go through them every year. But um, you know, I think it really, if, if, you, if you look at it that way, that uh, you'll be a better person after you go through it, why it helps. Oh, no. He didn't run into anybody. We had a hard year last year, and uh, it was the same kind of a situation. It doesn't make it any easier. It, it, it makes it the same, as far as I'm concerned. Um, it, as long as you know that it's going to get better, uh, that really helps. If you're in a situation where you've lost all your good players because of retirement, uh, like Boston is going through, for example, probably is more difficult to go through because you know it's not going to get better for a while. But we know that this is still a short period of time away. I mean, a, a year is a short period of time in anybody's life. And uh, we're going to have a full roster a year from now. So we can use this really as a time in which uh, we do more teaching and coaching, uh, that we do more basic, fundamental kind of stuff that our young players need. And then uh, when we finally get everybody together, look out. And that's this week's Inside Basketball. This is Channel 5. I'm Don Nelson with the Warriors. One NBA trade tonight, Phoenix dealt backup point guard Nigel Knight to San Antonio in exchange for a future second round draft choice. Scottie Pippen could only watch the Bulls game tonight against Atlanta. He's on the injured list with a sore ankle. The Hawks could use a speller for John Concack's jersey. He's not Conak the Magnificent. Chicago's Pete Myers was magnificent just before halftime. Check out his rainbow from beyond half court. And it'll be worth a second look here. This game is tied at 44 all at the point, and the Bulls rolled in the second half and blitzed Atlanta. The final was 106 80. Bulls win it. Two other games this evening Seattle clipped the Jazz at the Delta Center, and the Celtics took care of Milwaukee. USF and Santa Clara will meet Saturday night in the NCAA soccer playoffs. The Dons beat the Broncos last week 2 to 1. Jason Onachero had Santa Clara's goal. USF's winning score from Cato Solberg came with just more than seven minutes remaining. Last week's game was played at USF. Saturday's game will be at Santa Clara. The two schools tied for the WCC title. Warriors open at home tomorrow, as we said. The great Karnak needs a little spelling <laughs> yeah, help there. It does. Hey, enjoy that Montana interview. That's great. Well, uh, yeah, it's it was nice going back there and, and seeing it there and in good surroundings and doing well. And uh, when you care for people like, you know, like we all do, it's nice to see him happy. And except for his injuries not being on the field as much as he'd like to, things are going very well for them. Well, we look forward to uh, tomorrow night and the next two. Parts two and three. All right. Thanks a lot, Wayne. Yeah. And that's it for Eyewitness News. I'm Kate Kelly. And I'm Dave McElhatton. Good night and good luck from all of us at Eyewitness News. Good night. Watching Channel 5 Eyewitness News. You have questions. Channel 5 Eyewitness News has answers.